right, we're going to go into part two in finding the balance in commitment. And we already established last week several things, and we're going to recap that in just a second. But really what we're going to wind up covering uh, in this session really deals with these kinds of questions. How can we be committed people while trying to maintain balance in our lives at the same time, you know, without getting like this? The second question that we're really going to be addressing in this study is what are the tools or the boundaries, the guardrails that we can put in place so as not to venture into a life that's filled with extremes? And then third, why self-preservation, a mentality of self-preservation is not ever to be the mentality of a Christ follower. You can say amen because that, that means you concur, so I'll do that, then you do that. Oh. A spirit of self-preservation is never to be the mentality of a believer because that means that it's all about me. My main concern in life is, is just preserving me, my schedule, my agenda, my priorities, my white picket fence, and all this kind of stuff. That's never to be the mentality. If you ever adopt that mentality, you have slid from a Christ follower to a consumer. And that will destroy you for sure. Um, I want to read a few quotes to you. A guy named Jim Rome said this. Motivation is what gets you started, but only commitment is what keeps you going. If Pastor Debbie and I weren't committed to the Lord and to this ministry, we would have stopped going a long time ago. We were just reading today some pastoral statistics across the country. It said the average longevity in ministry is less than five years. Gone. Out of the ministry completely. The average pastoral stay in a location is 2.9 years, and the pastor moves on. You understand, this is, this is radical, and it has radical implications for the church at large. And so we don't want to go there. There's a lack of commitment somewhere down the line that when the going gets really rough, someone's bailing out, and they shouldn't be bailing out in a lot of cases Sammy Davis Jr., late Sammy Davis Jr. said this, you always have two choices in life, your commitment versus your fears. Wow. And then Heidi Reeder said, commitment is the foundation of all great accomplishments. A person who can accomplish is a person who's committed more so than the person on the left and the right of them. Then, of course, the former great football coach, Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi, two quotes. He said, most people fail not because of a lack of desire, but simply because of a lack of commitment. Then the second quote by Vince says, the quality of a person's life will be in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. Wow, how many of you know that you can't be excellent without a commitment to excellence? Right. Excellence is, Aristotle said, excellence is a habit and not an action. Wow. So, last week we covered a couple of these. If you look at, um, in the shaded box just above Roman numeral 2 on your notes there, you're going to see this universal principle that's going to be woven into all of the statements that we're going to make tonight. This principle will be the backdrop behind it. And here's the principle. It's always easier to get into something than it is out. Right? It's always easier to get in than it is to get out. So, we covered a couple of these. Go to Roman numeral two. The four areas of life where balance concerning commitments is crucial. Number one, we looked at last week, that we need balance when it comes to how we handle our money. Balance, of course, being defined by first establishing right biblical priorities, and then you move in balance down the line. But right biblical priorities, that's why if people are taking the financial peace class, 
they're establishing and they're learning about right biblical priorities and establishing that uh, set of priorities in their life because they know what needs to be first or who needs to be first, and then it kind of works out from there, correct? So from that place, if you put the Lord first and then you use wisdom in this other areas of your life concerning finances, you're going to wind up moving in a very healthy, solid balance that will keep you uh, financially solvent and not stressed out of your mind as a lifestyle. Number two, we looked at the fact that we need balance when it comes to how we handle our relationships. And one of the things that we said last week was it's important to be a good friend. It's important to be solid in our relationships. It's important to be loyal. It's important to be faithful. It's important to be a confidant. In other words, a person that can keep confidences without leaking someone's secrets when they share their heart with you. How many of you know that's a destroyer? That destroys people. It destroys relationships. It can even destroy brothers and sisters and, or two sisters or, you know, uh, even the Bible says even the best of friends. A gossiper, the Bible says, can drop seeds right in between the best of friends and even tear a lifelong friendship apart through misunderstandings and, and backbiting and little seeds of gossip and innuendos and misunderstandings. And so it's important um, that we maintain balance in our relationships. And one of the things that I talked about last week in reference to balance within the relationship was uh, I talked about giving advice or giving counsel. And I said, for example, even if you have a very good friend and as a very good, and, and with you trying to be a very good friend, they're always asking you questions because their life always seems to be in a dilemma. They're always in a relational nightmare. They're always in this. They're always in that. And they're always asking you for the very best of your time, the best of your counsel, and then they turn around and do exactly what they want to do. Right. Over and over and over and over. And what I said last week is you got to call a timeout on that. No longer should you give your friend the very best of your time. Doesn't mean you don't care about him anymore. Doesn't mean you, don't, you, you stop being friends with him. But you cannot go running to their aid in terms of counsel and advice every single time they have an issue because their life is an issue. And they don't listen to anything. If they had wisdom enough to understand a good word when it's coming toward them, they would they would be applying what you've already said. Listen, Debbie and I have been through this for years. It's almost like we need a digital recorder and someone calls again. Oh, you again? Yeah. Let me play something for you. 1997, 2003, 2009, 2012, 2020, and here you are again. Guess what? We have nothing new to say. If you would have applied it in 1997, we wouldn't have need for this digital recorder. So guess what? When someone calls and they're in that kind of boat, they don't get the best of pastoral time. They don't get put at the top of our counseling list of people we need to meet with. Can I ask you a question? Why should they? With all due respect, in many ways, they are wasting our valuable time. Do you respect yourself enough to respect your own time? Or do you think so little of yourself, you're just going to give it to anyone? You're not called to kill time. You're called to redeem time. What did time ever do to you? Why do you want to kill it? And sometimes you're killing it by casting your pearls before swine, the Bible says. That means giving your best time, your best counsel, your best love, your best care to people that are just going to stomp on it. And do what they want to do anyhow. Tell you what that's going to do. It will make you codependent and keep you unhealthy. Because that's an unhealthy trait, by the way, to be codependent. That means you have such a desperate need to be needed, you don't care who needs you as long as you need it. In other words, you are a crisis person. 
When you hear of a crisis going on, you get turned on. If everything's going smoothly for everyone, you'll almost like a firefighter that's just waiting for a fire. You know, they train, they train, they train. Uh, oh, but man, as soon as that bell rings, brrr, ee, 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 ee. well, listen, you're not called to be a firefighter. You're called to be a Christ follower. What are you doing? If you happen to be a firefighter by profession, praise God, thank you for doing that. Do a great job at that. Be ready, be prepared. But you notice when you get called out to go do your job, it's because the situation is real. Not because someone thinks it's real and they just want someone there. Listening to themselves babble on for the next two hours only to then do what they want to do anyhow. You understand that some people are emotionally unhealthy. And so what they are really, what they have chosen to wrap their life around is toxicity and dysfunction that becomes a new norm for them. But it does, just because it's somebody's norm, that doesn't mean you have to let it become your norm to run to every fire they set. Sometimes it need to, the house needs to burn down. So what I said last week <clears throat> was to, to maintain balance because listen, as I said, if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to wind up codependent. Now, some of you, because of how you've grown up and what you were exposed to as a child, you already have codependent tendency, tendencies in you. You need the Lord to help you with that, identify that, expose it, and break it. Or it's going to wear you out. You're going to be the caretaker of the world, the nurse of the world. But you're going to find that some people just want your time. They don't want to be fixed. They just want your time. You know, one of the things about going into nursing home ministry years ago, when we started doing nursing home ministry, was when I discovered that very elderly people, in many cases, their own family no longer sees them and all this kind of stuff, and their world has, has shrunk to the size of a thimble. So guess what the people really want? Anyone to come in and see them. And when anyone goes in to see them, in many cases, you know, if, they're, uh, if they want to talk, as soon as they get talking, all you have to do is nod and grunt. You'll be good for the next three hours. They're going to give you their life story. They're going to tell you how they used to walk to school five miles when they were kids, and, and that's okay. And you know what? They feel good because... They want time. And they're not wrong to want that time. Because a lot of times they've been forgotten about. They've been neglected by their own family. Put in a home. But when it comes to otherwise more normalized situations, you don't want to be codependent. If you have those tendencies already, you will need the Lord to break those don't feed those things in yourself. You need to break those things. Get them exposed. Secondly, when you, if you keep going on down that road like this, sooner or later, you're going to get cynical and bitter and burnt out by people, and you're going to say, I no longer like people. I don't trust people anymore. I give myself to a 1,000 people, and they've all used me. You know what? You've let them use you. Don't blame them. Blame the person who stares you back in the mirror first. Because they already have issues. You know that. But who's got bigger issues if you're the one that keeps going back there? If we don't move in balance, you're going to burn out. And when you burn out, you're even going to throw good opportunities away. Because you're going to say, I've been there, done that, I, I'm burnt out, I'm wasted, I'm all used up. Well, yeah, but you used yourself up on the wrong people. Because you didn't listen to stuff like this. 
And be, most times when people don't listen to stuff like this, it's for one simple reason. They move by their emotions instead of by God's word. And but I tell you, your emotions are like the waves of the sea. They're going to take you on a weird trip. And always going to be up and down and around here. And Yeah, but I love him so much. I love her. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, 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 but. They need a kick in the butt. That's the butt. That's the only butt they need. And going to wear you out. Go listen going to steal the prime years of your life, going to take your money, going to take the best of your emotions, going to take the best of your love, going to take the best of your time, going to take the best of your attention, and it's going to amount to nothing. Then you ask yourself, are we having fun yet? If I move by emotions, my emotions are going to put a hook in my jaw and going to take me like a fish gets taken down and through the river. But if I move by the principles of God's word that I'm articulating tonight, you're going to be saved from yourself and be put on a higher, uh, a higher path where you can still minister and still give of yourself, but you're going to have the ability to put up boundaries. Any, any pond or lake or dam that doesn't have good enough boundary, good enough levees, be like New Orleans, remember? When that big hurricane came there, the levees gave way. Ooh. There's our introduction. So now let's go to number three. Never get involved in need-driven relationships. They're the worst kind. But I need, I need, I need. No, you don't. You don't need what they got. Let's go to number three now. The third area that we need to grasp, get a hold of some balance in is this. When it comes to how we handle our time, and of course, time always carries within it the idea of opportunities. Time always gives birth to opportunities. How many of you know that every moment of time, matter of fact, let me put it this way. The word moment is taken from a Greek root word that's atomos, from which we get the English word atom. So that means that when you split the atom, that within the atom there's right molecules of Boom, that means within every moment, it's like splitting an atom. Within every moment of time, there's an opportunity for that to break wide open and nuclear power to be unleashed. Within every moment lies opportunity. So therefore, time is what gives birth to opportunity. How you use your time will determine whether or not you redeem the time and milk every opportunity that God gives you out of that, or you don't even have eyes to see it and you roll right over it. Let's say if you keep praying for God to use you, Lord, use me. But if you don't get eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that's sensitive to sense when God's in a picture, when he's, when he's arranged some circumstances or whatever, then you're going to roll right over it and then keep asking him to use you. And he's saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, but I'm transmitting on this, you know, on this wavelength and you're receiving on a carnal wavelength. Let me change you so that I can give you spiritual ears and spiritual eyes. This way where I'm transmitting, you will also be receiving. Because he's not going to change for us. Well, I said he's not going to change for us. We're to be conformed to the image of the Son. He's not to be conformed to man's image. Man's a mess. Well, look at the scripture under point three on your notes there. Paul said, be very careful then how you live. That means you don't have the right to get up in the morning and waste time so that you wake up just in time to take a nap. Because we will give an account for every moment that God has given us. 
Time does not belong to us. Time is merely lent to us. Because if time belonged to us, we'd be able to bottle time and take it with us into eternity. But you can't take anything. So that means it really doesn't belong to you. Who does it belong to? The only one who had the ability to create it. So Paul said, be careful then how you live. Time's a gift. Life is a gift. And within those two, meeting of those two elements, there's atomic power ready to be unleashed. He said, don't walk as unwise people, but walk as wise people. Well, then how do wise people walk? They redeem the time for God's purposes, making the most of every opportunity because time is what gives birth to opportunity because the days around you are evil. And I don't think we've ever seen a more evil day than what we're living in now. I don't think we've ever seen. I was just reading today how in this pathetic, I'm going to say it, pathetic rally, a pro-abortion rally, you got Senator Chuck Schumer from New York and other people, I mean, cheering, blatantly cheering and going crazy like they're at a football game for what? For abortion. How many of you had abortions? Yeah, and then people go crazy. Ding, 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 like, like someone scored a touchdown for the Patriots. You understand? And this guy's Jewish. So you say, oh, Jewish people are one of God's chosen people. I'll tell you what, he's not chosen. He's chosen, all right, but not by the Lord right now. And he better repent. Because he can wear his yarmulke all he wants. That's wicked. That's flat out wicked. You can have different opinions and all this kind of stuff, but you, when you have a rally, how many have had abortions? You know, 50, 50 women raised their hand. Yeah! What, what, are we, what are we talking about here? As though there's no emotional repercussions that go along with that on top of the moral and spiritual implications. You understand, we're in that time that Isaiah said when evil is called good and good is now called evil. We're in that time. Wake up. We're in that last day. Paul believed that 2,000 years ago. But if he only could have foreseen this day, he would have said, ah, I'll take that little phrase back. He said, make the most of every opportunity. This was 2,000 years ago because the days are evil. So if you want to buy it back from the devil, it's yours to take. But if you're as carnal as he is, you won't have the ability to ransom back what God wants you to ransom back. It's almost like time is a commodity. How many of you know that money is simply a commodity? The Bible never says that money is the root of all evil. Why? Because money is simply a piece of paper. It's a commodity that makes this world go round, this world system. If you have the commodity, you can get stuff done. But it's what you love that can make you evil, not what you have. And if you love money, the Bible says very clearly, you can't love this world and love the Lord at the same time. If you love this world, it just proves that the love of God, the love for the Father is not in you. Doesn't mean you don't like this world and you don't love your loved ones and people in it. He means really love the world, all that it stands for, all of its moral positions, all of its uh, rebellion against God and God's word. If you love that, you have an issue. You better check your own salvation. You better see this world system for what it is. It's evil, it's wicked, and according to 1 John 5, 19, it's inspired and juiced by the wicked one. The wicked one. Not even wicked men. Wick, the spirit of the devil. Uses guys like Chuck Schumer. I want to be honest with you. You vote for him or anyone that he hangs with. 
How can you say you're a believer? I just put it out there. Because there's really no such thing as just voting for a candidate without buying into the whole platform of the party on which they stand and with whom they hang. You, you, get, the whole, you get the whole Trojan horse, baby. So you better be careful. Don't vote for the devil and wonder why he brings demonic things. Because that same devil that doesn't seem that bad to you because he's offering everything under the, under the sun to you will be the one to steal the gospel from your grandbabies. From your grandbabies. And you voted to make it happen. I'm just putting it out there. The guys, that, you know, there's just some wicked people doing wicked things. You better smarten up. Because as of tonight, you can't say you don't know about this guy. And everyone he hangs with, by the way. I'll say it again. And everyone he hangs with, he doesn't hang with them for no reason. Time is an important element. It's a commodity. You see, the same $20 bill that gets taken out on the streets and crack or heroin is purchased, and it goes through a set of hands and into a package store and all that, blah, 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 blah. You understand that it can go through a banking system, a blah, 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 and then when you go cash a check or get some change after a purchase somewhere, that very same 20 that bought heroin a week ago comes back into your hand as a simple piece of paper. And when you bring it to the house of the Lord, it's prayed over. Guess what? It's consecrated and sanctified. The gospel business goes forward with the same 20 redeemed back now that once bought drugs. Guess what that's called? It's been ransomed back. That wicked thing is now consecrated before the Lord. And so is time. We don't buy it back. The devil said, if you're not going to do anything about it, I certainly am. Why do you think people stand around on a street corner? What's up? I don't know. What's going on? What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Nothing. He wants people to waste their lives. Frivolous pursuits, empty relationships, dead-end things. And he wants to use substances, subs all kinds of substances, to snare people, soul, and drag them to hell. And at the very least, waste their life and potential here in time. Neutralize their God-given potential. Wow. Well, there's a saying that says the person who tries to burn the candle at both ends isn't as smart as he thinks he is. See, we can't commit to everything in our lives without the need to eliminate something else. You only have so much room on your plate. You're either going to move by needs or priorities. Which is it going to be? God wants us to focus in on things that really count, things that really matter. Number one, beginning with things eternal, then things that have to do with time. Don't dabble in 50 things. Focus on a few things that really give the best of who you are to what God's called you to do and stay in that lane and work it. Wow. You know what? You could buy all kinds of time management books and you find somewhere in there, create a to-do list. Well, I would, I would counter by saying this. <clears throat> Alongside that, why don't you make a not-to-do list? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do in 2020. Same stupid thing I did in 2019. 
That's a great place to start. I mean, our list will be pretty substantial if you just go in that category. All right, so number one, our money. Number two, our relationships. Number three, our time. And number four, we need to maintain and create a balance when it comes to handle our service. That means where we serve, what ministries we serve in, how we serve the Lord, how we serve people. We can't fall into a trap that leads to burnout, and yet by the same token, you cannot live a self-centered life because that's going to destroy you. You see what Jesus said right under point four, right on your notes there. Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Uh Uh-oh. That's going to eliminate a few people right there from greatness. But it doesn't need to. It's a choice. Look what Jesus said. You want to be, how many of you want to be great tonight? I want to be great in God's eyes. I don't care about being great in man's eyes. Because they, some people think Chuck Schumer's great. That shows you how much people know. Jesus said, whoever wants to become great in my eyes must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must voluntarily become your slave. This is really a super servant. And Jesus said, if that ruffles your feathers, watch what I'm going to do as your model, your example. He said, just as I, the son of man, did not come to be served, but to serve. And a matter of fact, in my case, Jesus is saying, I'm going to serve myself up onto the cross. Just be thankful you don't have to do that. But you can't say you're my follower if I say this is how you're supposed to live and you choose to live that way. You're really not showing the world you're my follower. You're saying you like to use my name when it's convenient, but you're you're your own person. You're your own patient, and you're you're your own physician. And it's not going to work. Jesus said, I've come to set an example for you, and this is it. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because there's no way that I could serve you and live a selfish life at the same time. Serving you delivers me from me. You know, we had an old friend of ours who used to say this. Some people need to be delivered from drugs or booze or this or pornography or this. But some people just need to be delivered from their own goodness. Which is to say, some people grew up very religious and they're so proud of how religiously they kept their traditions and their candles and beads or whatever it was their trip was. You know, they're so proud of how good they were, they amazed themselves. But Isaiah 64 in verse 4 says, even the best of man's efforts is but filthy rags before the Lord. So, so much for that stuff. And some people, when they come to Christ out of that background, it's the battle of their life shedding religious baggage along life's journey. That's tough baggage to shed, man, because being religious and being good at it becomes an identity in itself. You know how we know? That's exactly what wrapped Paul up. When Paul's name was still Saul, he was so proud of being humble, he amazed himself. He was so proud of being religious He said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I slapped the taste out of your mouth if you call me anything less than devoted. And I loved every minute of it. The power, the prestige, walking the spiritual corporate ladder of Judaism and getting all the accolades and adulation, it turned me on. That's why Jesus had to knock him off his horse. He didn't meet him on his horse. He knocked him silly off his horse and blinded him and made him walk like a little kid. And he made a mere commoner. He used a commoner to be the one to lay hands on him so his sight was restored. He didn't go to an archbishop. 
He said, now, Saul, have I got your attention yet? You're not the man. You're the man in man's religious creation, which sickened me. Because religion is this, man's best efforts to reach God apart from bowing the knee to Christ. I want to say that again. Here's a working definition of religion. Man's best efforts to reach God apart from truly bowing the knee to Christ. I'll do anything but have to bow the knee to Christ. Give me the candles, give me the rosaries, send me a box of offering cards every year. Do whatever. But really bowing the knee to Christ. That's where my whole heart has to go. Whoa. Is that too real for you? All right, let me lighten up. Okay, let's go to Roman number three. We're going to close. So now we've seen the four areas in which we've got to establish balance and then live our lives in this balance while all the while being committed people. So let's get to God's solution. Ready? How are we going to do this stuff? How do we live a blessed, successful life that doesn't get burnt out? Number one, God says to choose your commitments carefully. This principle is taught all throughout the Bible, particularly all throughout the book of Proverbs. Look at the scriptures that I've put on your notes. Choose your commitments in life carefully. Number one, look at the scripture. Proverbs 13, 16, from this particular translation, says a wise man thinks ahead. A fool doesn't and even brags about it. Pretty powerful. So here's the key thought. Think ahead and choose your commitments carefully. Look at the second scripture, Proverbs 14 and verse 15. Only a simpleton believes everything that he's told, but a prudent man, a wise man, checks to see where he's going. So you'd see the key thought there is when in doubt, check it out. Look at these last two scriptures, Proverbs 14, 16. says a wise man is cautious and thus he avoids danger. But a fool just plunges ahead with great confidence, even though they've just bought a ticket on the Titanic. But they got a great deal on it. Look at Proverbs 21, 23. Solomon said, learn to keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of a lot of trouble. Oh, man, some of you ought to, some of you ought to blow that up and put it on your fridge. It would help us all at one time or another, right? Here's what the point is. Check out the consequences first and then choose your commitments carefully on the basis of that. In other words, think it through. When it comes to the time of commitment, it's a decision about how you're going to spend your time, your money, your reputation, your energy... Keep an open mind and a shut mouth, and you'll get a lot of, uh, you'll make a lot of progress there. Now, does that mean, do these scriptures mean I should never take a risk or that life is going to be risk-free? Absolutely not. You can't live life, and you certainly can't live a life of faith without taking risks. That's what faith is really all about, stepping out, taking a risk. How do you know if you're going to like a particular ministry or doing this or doing that? How are you going to know if you don't try it? But what people tend to do is live their life in one of two extremes. Either they're too cautious or they're too daring. Those two extremes are not good. If you're too cautious, you become a coward, a faith coward. But if you're too daring, you become a fool. So the Bible says to choose your commitments carefully, right? Now, I will say this. Your Christian commitment demands that you get involved. Particularly when people have needs, when someone has a need that's legitimate, that's genuine. How about the, how about the, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Right? People passed him by, even a religious person passed him by, and here's this Samaritan. 
He has the guy taken to a place to be taken care of, and he even pays for the guy to have a safe room and some food and some medical care. Jesus said, who, who was the good Samaritan here? We heard this years ago, and it, it has really gotten us many, many times over the years. Here's what it was. I was reading this story about this guy who used to be the president of Notre Dame University years ago, and uh, he was always wanting to write a series of books and do that and do speaking lectures and all this kind of stuff. Every time he tried to do this, that, and the other thing, some crisis would pop up on campus or some huge thing, some huge project. In other words, the point is, no matter what he tried, he could never get to certain aspects of what his, uh, his bucket list was, what he felt as though his life really needed to be about. And he was, said he was praying one day, and, and uh, of course, in his case, he went to Mass, but he's praying, and he said, over the course of time, he said, I, I blurted out one day, God, I'm trying to do my work, and I keep getting interrupted. He said, and then I felt this strong impression come over me. Your interruptions are your work. See, he planned so strategic, he planned God right out of his agenda. He planned, you know, What's the word? Pliability. He, he, organ, he structured pliability right out of his life. Okay, so number one, choose your commitments carefully. Number two, speaking of which, choose your commitments prayerfully. Prayerfully. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 to 7, not on your notes. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 to 7, Solomon talks about a guy going into the temple and praying and making vows to the Lord and then not paying those vows, not keeping his promises. You know, like a lot of people, when they're in, a, when they're in grave danger and they say, God, if you can hear me, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you, I'll change my life. You give them about two weeks after he delivers them, they go right back. Guess what? People may forget, but the Lord doesn't forget. Those are serious indictments. Vows, promises, things uttered are commitments to the Lord that are verbal. But the Lord binds those things. See, we can't live our life without making commitments. We commit all of our time to something. We commit something to somebody. And then Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 through 3, uh, this is where he says, let your words be few, but let your commitments be clear and strong. Because God's in heaven, and we're merely here on earth. Here's what the end of that passage says, Ecclesiastes 5, 3. Keep your promises, for it is far better never to say you'll do something than to say it and then not do it. Woo. Don't go there. Okay, so you said, well, how do I sort through this? Well, look at the scripture right under point two, the first scripture right there. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. We can ask the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom to make better decisions and prioritize my life and be a committed person. And the Lord will give you wisdom and he gives to all liberally and without reproach. That means he won't smack you down. He won't mock you. For asking for wisdom. He gives, he gives gladly and joyfully to all who ask. Let's go to number three. So we want to make our commitments carefully. Two, prayerfully. Number three, determine to be a person of commitment. Determine to be a person of commitment. You will never be a successful person without being a person of commitment. It's just, they're intertwined. You just can't do it. You certainly can't be used in your maximum capacity before the Lord um, without, without commitment. So, we want to be a person of commitment. Look at what Jesus said. I'm sorry, this is in 1 Kings 8, first scripture. 
Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as, um, as at this day. Well, look at that first portion. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly devoted to the Lord, completely devoted. So we've got to be a person of commitment. Luke 9, 62. Look at the second scripture. Jesus said, no one, after putting his or her hand to the plow and then looking back, remains fit for the kingdom of God. It mean, what he means is, as long as you're looking back, this is, you know, if you're plowing a field, you start looking back, and pretty soon the, the furrows in your life are going to look like this, and the whole world looks at your field and says, man, somebody or something got their life off track. So Jesus said, if you're going to be if I'm at the finish line, you're supposed to be fixing your eyes on me, but you think that which I delivered you out of is that good that you want to go back to your own vomit? He said, then do it. But you better choose this day where, which direction you're going to go in. You try and go in both, you're going to make a mess out of everything. And in the process, you become unfit for the purposes of God for which I brought you in. You disqualify yourself. And he doesn't want us to do that. See this Galatians 6, 9 there in your notes? Paul said, let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And then Matthew 5, 37, Jesus said, Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Why? Because the devil talks out of both sides of his mouth. The devil says one thing, but he always means another thing. The devil won't get you, give you a straight answer. He wants to get you all tied up and tangled up into, well, maybe if I get around to it, I'm not sure. Well, you know, if uh, Jupiter aligned with Mars and then, you know. It's not the age of Aquarius. Who cares about that? <laughs> let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Speak the truth in love. Be an honest person. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Because anything other than that is of the world. And the Lord doesn't want us tangled all up in that. I want to give you one last scripture. Luke 17.33. You could just write it off to the side. Luke 17.33. Jesus said this. By the way, you could also put verse 32. Luke 17.32 and 33, because 32 sets the stage for the impact of 33. But Luke 17.32, Jesus said, is it back here? Yeah, well, all right. He said, remember Lot's wife. Do you remember what happened to Lot's wife? Yeah. Yeah. She became the Morton Salt person. But she didn't get any royalties for it. No contracts were necessary. No lawyers. Yeah, if you look on the, you know, the blue Morton Salt thing, it's her. It's her. She even got an umbrella going on this time now. Oh, well, they just they just modernized her. I mean, you can't knock them for that. So, so Jesus said, "Remember Lot's wife." Well, what was her issue? She's being delivered, spared from a life of sin and destruction and perversion. And when she's being delivered, she got to look back. She's just got to look back. She's just got to look back. You know what? Because here's what the devil does: you're being delivered out, and the devil's whispering already. Come on, aren't you reacting a little too strongly? It wasn't all that bad. Come on, there were some good times in there too. Don't you remember? Don't Come on now, you liked a lot of that. Don't get all holy with me. Well, well, you know, I suppose <laughs> liquid nitrogen, all right. You know, like Terminator 2? So Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. She listened to the devil to look back, and it cost her everything. 
Then he says in verse 33, whoever seeks to save his own life will lose it. But whoever loses his life, in other words, gives his or her life agenda for my sake, will gain it all. You can't save yourself, is the point. You can't deliver yourself. If you try and live a life of abandonment to Christ, but self-preservation at the same time, you will die. You want to preserve your life and keep your, keep your nine to five thing and keep your way of life and keep all your things humming and you think you're going to serve the Lord successfully at the same time? Uh-uh. No, no, no. That's the wrong equation. I mean, what, what would someone do if they had their whole life mapped out and they had... Oh, you know, their IRAs and their 401k, everything popping, man. I got, I'm going to get my 20 and retire. What if the Lord speaks to you? I'm sending you to Zimbabwe. And that's where you'll spend the remainder, remainder of your days preaching the gospel. And maybe he sends you where Mother Teresa was. Said, forget all that you planned. That's where I'm sending you going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to wrap our head around that? Will we? Will we answer the call? Or will we tell them, mm, I'm into self-preservation. Jesus said, well, that's fine. But you understand you're going to lose it anyhow. But if you choose, listen, but if you choose to lose for my sake, you will win where it counts most. If you try and win on your own terms, you're going to lose where it really counts. But if you choose to lose for my sake on the front end, not knowing what you're going to get, I promise you're going to get the victor's crown. Number four, let's close with this. Be a person who keeps their commitment. We talked about making the commitments carefully, prayerfully. We talked about being a person of commitment. And then last, be a person that keeps their commitments. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Yeah. They were a husband and wife team in the New Testament. And they said oh, to the apostles, we got pieces of land and we're going to sell this land and give all the proceeds to the Lord. We're going to bring it to the church and then you distribute it. To, to people who have needs. And then they sold that land and they kept some of the money back. And they try and come in. You know, imagine Peter and them saying, so, so how did it go? Oh, everything went great. Did you get what you wanted? Uh-huh. So you're going to give it all to the Lord? Absolutely. And then Peter looks at him with fire in his eyes. How is it, he said, that you've allowed Satan to fill your heart so much that you actually lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back for yourself some of the money that you had vowed to give? Now you will die with your money. Boom! He dropped right there like a bad habit. Then his wife comes in, tries the same whole head trip. She gets dropped. They had a double funeral and one day church service. Guess what the Bible said? It says the fear of the Lord came in the church, healthy, righteous fear of the Lord. And it says, and those round about, in other words, the skeptics, those trying to decide whether they become that Christian and join that crazy church. It says some were drawn to that kind of holiness and power and clarity and some knew that they better stay away. But it, it clears things. It clears things up. Look at the last two scriptures right on your notes. Solomon said, a person who promises a gift but doesn't give is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. 
Proverbs 11.3 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their own duplicity, their own double-mindedness. And I want to give you one other scripture. Just write the reference off to the side. Psalm 15 and verse 4. Psalm 15 and verse 4. It's where David said, a person that the Lord is pleased in. They keep their word. They keep their commitments, even swearing to their own hurt. That means even when it's inconvenient, they still do what they've promised. Obviously, unless they're unable to. If they're unable to, they don't, they're unable to, but then they tell the person. They don't just blow it off and not show up. Wow, does that sound good? Listen, that's how you can live a life of balance and commitment at the same time. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Let's stand. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to do two things. First, click the logo and subscribe to our channel. And second, like, comment, and share our videos with those whom you care about. We're always updating our page with the latest messages and original content. Thanks for watching.